Hi, everyone. This is Jason Birak of Wall Street from Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street from Main Street podcast interview. Today, we have a treat for you guys. Instead of doing a normal interview, we have a special discussion roundtable here to talk about their new book, The Money Bubble, which is now available on audiobook on Audible. Our co-author is James Turk, founder of Gold Money, and returning guest, John Rubino. Gentlemen, thanks for coming on my show together. I really appreciate it. Thanks, thanks Jason. Thanks for having us on, Jason. Now, um... In the money bubble, you guys mentioned how large American banks were bailed out with emergency currency swaps by the Federal Reserve and U.S. Treasury Department after the tequila crisis in Mexico in the 1990s. Uh, why do you think currency swaps have gone from hardly being used to being used so often now by the U.S., Japan, and the ECB? Well, I think a good reason for that is that it's not visible to the public. You have to dig into the Federal Reserve's balance sheet to see what's actually going on, which makes it somewhat different than a direct taxpayer bailout. Oh, oh yeah, that's that's a great point. Yeah, because, um, you know, the overt bailouts, I think one of the reasons um, in 2008, right, the pitchforks actually started to come out. People who didn't care about markets, right, when the banks started to collapse and they were worried about taking their money out of the ATM, right, then the people start, more people start to wake up and the pitchforks actually start to come out. And I think that scared the people, the politicians in D.C. and the people on Wall Street. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, people don't like to have their pockets picked. And uh, basically, that's what happened when the uh, uh, banks get bailed out. Now, um, John, in, in terms of the, the currency swaps here, uh, are, are you on the same page as James or, or do you think there's other uh, hidden reasons behind behind the currency swaps? Oh, no, I, I think that um, in, in general, um, so much of what they're doing is so outrageous right now that if it was made public and if it was understood by the average person, we would have a revolution right now. So, so almost all of the major policy initiatives now are, are crafted with the idea of hiding the reality of what's going on. And so, you know, you can look at um, um, interest rate policy right now where um, – you know they're forcing rates down to to levels that are are really damaging to a lot of people, but a lot of people don't completely understand what's happening yet. They just see that their CDs aren't paying them what they used to, but they're not completely grasping that the money that they used to receive from their CD is flowing to other people, the bankers and the favored customers of the bankers. You know, if, if people completely understood that flow of funds, that money is coming out of, directly out of the pockets of retirees and savers and going into the pockets of the 1%, if people got that, things would be very different than they are right now. But it's being hidden because it isn't clear to most people what these policies mean. And then that, that's true across the board with uh, global economic policy right now. And almost all of the, uh, the developed world countries um, you're seeing policies that aren't well explained, aren't well understood, but all have basically the same effect of a, a transfer of wealth from one group to another. Yeah, and it seems like a lot of these other bills, you know, whether they're financial or not, there's o they're always sneaking taxes or other things into these bills. So, you know, we have the Patriot Act, which is uh, it's not patriotic at all, really, because, you know, it's going after our individual rights and freedoms. These bills are doing basically the opposite of what they're in they're, um at least to the public uh, saying to do. Obamacare was a tax and it was, uh, you know, the Supreme Court uh, said it was legal because it was a tax that they couldn't, you know, fully repeal it. But, you know, all these bills, it seems they're, they're trying to sneak in, you know, hidden bailouts or bail-ins or extra taxes and things like that. They're, they're sneaking them into all these bills that, that are not financial bills. They're going after wealth, Jason, and they're doing it in a variety of different ways. Um, the, I agree wholeheartedly with what John was saying in terms of the low interest rates, uh, taking money away from savers and using it in other places. Uh, the big picture is, is that the, the, the system itself has become unsustainable because there's simply just too much debt uh, in the system. You know, debt requires the pay, repayment of uh, principal that also call, uh, calls for an ongoing payment in interest uh, on that debt. And the reason why the levels of interest rates are so high, or another reason for it, is simply because it makes it easier for the government to service that the debt that it has. So if you stop and consider that you know the government has 18 trillion dollars over 18 trillion dollars of debt now a 1% increase in interest rates adds 180 billion dollars a year to the federal deficit uh if you take it up to a normal fair interest rate of 5 or 6% uh you're adding almost a trillion dollars to the federal um 
uh, federal spending, that's about a third of government revenue, and they're not going to cut back in other areas just to pay interest. So the lower interest rates are just another way of trying to sustain a system that's become unsustainable because of the huge levels of debt. And, and it all comes back to the printing press. This is what allows governments to get away with stuff like this, because uh, if they actually had to come up with the, the money to cover their deficits, in other words, get it from people directly through taxation, they, they could never do the things they're doing. But because they can just print money out of thin air, or create it out of thin air electronically, um, they can run massive deficits, which they've been doing all around the world for the last 30 years, and then spend that money in order to get reelected or to further their other aims and do it in a way that people don't understand. Because we, we just know, you know what we're getting from the government and we know what we're giving to the government, but we don't know how much money is being created. That's not something that the average person understands or sees. And so while inflation is a tax, um, it, it lowers the value of your savings because the, uh, the increase in the, the amount of money outstanding makes each individual piece of money less valuable. It's an invisible tax. We don't see it. And so that is the key central way that all of the stuff is being hidden. And, you know, as long as they have this power, as long as they have currencies that everybody in the world wants, and the ability to create as much new currency as they want to, they can get away with this stuff. So the uh, you know the end game is when the currencies don't work anymore, and in the meantime they they are they're succeeding in fooling us, and uh, and doing these outrageous things without consequence. And uh, plus, um, all, a lot of these other countries, whether it's China, are running dollar pegs. So if they're running dollar pegs, you know, they, they're not in control of their own monetary policy. So if the U.S. prints and increases their base money supply, they have to increase their base money supply. They have to print more of their own local currency to soak up all those dollars coming into their country. So basically then the U.S., um, with the system we have now, the U.S. can ex essentially export a lot of its inflation and, you know, stick it to someone else in the, in the global supply chain uh, outside the United States. That's exactly right. And, you know, outside the United States, the incomes of a lot of people are a lot lower than they are in the United States. In fact, you know, most of the world has incomes lower than the United States. So the inflation rate, that impact of inflation, uh, you know, to, to purchase the, uh, the necessaries for survival, you know, food, clothing, shelter, are going to have a bigger impact outside the U.S. than they will even in the U.S., yeah, I, I completely agree. Mm -hmm. and, and another thing that's happened just lately along the, um, the lines of excess dollars in the world is that uh, the, the fact that we're creating so many dollars um, and that until very recently, that kept the price or the, the exchange rate of the dollar fairly low relative to the euro and the yen. That led a lot of people around the world to borrow a lot of dollars. We now have about $9 trillion of, of dollar-denominated debt in other countries. Um, and then... We let the dollar go up in value because uh, we, we should talk about the currency war in a minute and how this all works. But uh, the, the dollar has gone up lately in value versus the euro in the yen, which means all nine trillion dollars that have been borrowed in the last couple of years out there. And it's all underwater. Everybody is losing money on these very big loans that they took out, whether they took a uh, took them out of the government level to build infrastructure projects or at a hedge fund level to operate some kind of a leverage carry trade. Whatever it is they did, they're losing money on it. And that's one of the big black swans out there. What happens when these things start to blow up? And we, we haven't seen that happen yet, but it's a fairly safe bet that the, the numbers are so outrageous that we're going to see some crises um, in some parts of the world that, that can be traced back to um, the, the dollar printing press that flooded the world with dollars and encouraged these guys to, uh, to over borrow in a currency that was going to fluctuate. So that, that's just one of the black swans out there, one of the potential crises that we could see in the next couple of years. Yeah, there's there's so many black swans out there. Um, a lot of them, there was like almost no volatility for 2013 and 2014. And then 2015, when the calendar turned over, like almost right after January 1st, you know, we just saw a whole bunch of black swans appear. I mean, I guess the oil price falling in 2014 was a black swan because basically no one saw the oil price falling like that. I don't think there was really any experts except for some of these hardcore deflationists that were predicting oil was going to fall for every single year, you know, for the last 10 years. Um, my next question, guys, has to do with the currency war, actually, um, since we're talking about that. Uh, what's the normal end game, in your opinion, for what happens during and after a currency war? 
Do you want to go first on this one, John, or should oh, I? You, you go ahead, James. That's you. Yeah. yeah, the end game of a currency war is that everybody loses. There are no winners in a currency war because ultimately um, it, it impacts negatively on economies for all of the participants in the war. So even though it's not a shooting war, it does have negative impacts. And ultimately, ultimately the economy and the currencies themselves are the casualties in, in the war. And because we're talking about the economy, you're basically talking about everybody who participates in the economy. So it is a very, very serious situation. And, you know, the world uh, currency wars are heating up. Um, and they are heating up because governments are using currencies, not what they should be, which is a neutral tool in commerce that everybody can use reliable, reliably uh, and expect, um, you know, a reliable source of preserve purchasing, purchasing power over long periods of time. But instead of using currencies or instead of currencies actually circulating as a neutral tool in commerce, governments are using uh, currencies as a political tool or some would say a political weapon since we're talking about wars. Um, and in order to bring a perceived foe, um, you know, to um, crash the economy, I, I guess one of the most recent examples was uh, Iran when they were closed out of the SWIFT system, which is the global transfer system for international banking. Uh, it literally collapsed the Iranian cur currency, and that in turn co collapsed the Iranian economy. And what, what we're doing now um, around the world is kind of taking turns, lowering our interest rates and increasing our, our money supply and trying to force the value of our currencies down. You know, in, in the years following the 2008-2009 uh, crisis. It was the U.S. who acted first. We adopted quantitative easing on, on the, uh, the, the most aggressive scale. And so the, the value of the dollar went down, which helped us generate a little bit of growth, relatively speaking, but it came at the expense of our trading partners. Um, Europe and Japan started to drop into deflationary recessions that could easily turn into a depression. And so they kind of panicked. And, and now, now they're aggressively increasing their money supply, trying to push down the value of their currencies, which has made the dollar go up. And so, as James said, this, this is a zero-sum game. Nobody ends up winning in the end. You just have temporary winners and temporary losers. But in the end, everybody's currency is being pushed down in value um, over time. And so that's that's basically global inflation that we're talking about. But it comes irregularly. You know, one currency is up like the dollar is today, which is deflationary for us. Uh, and then other currencies are down like the euro and the yen, which is more or less inflationary for them, relatively speaking. You know, you know, one aside, guys, I just got done listening to a. Uh, a recorded book about the uh, the events that led up to World War One. You know all the political stuff that was going on back then. And in that entire book, they never mention monetary policy. They never mention um, the head of the Bank of England or any other central bank, because that that those were the days of the classical gold standard when monetary policy was not that important. You know the money was just gold, and everybody else's currency was uh, um, just a name for a given weight in gold. And so, you know, there were a lot of problems back then, but monetary policy was not one of them. And so our world today is so different from that world back then in, in many negative ways. And, and one of the big ones is that uh, now, today, central bankers are the major financial celebrities in the world. They're the most powerful people out there because monetary policy has come to dominate everything. And it allows us, you know, giving the government the, po the power to create as much currency as they want leads to a world of excessive debt and increasing inflation and increasing instability, uh, which <clears throat> inevitably leads to some kind of global crisis. And so that, that's the world we've created, and that's where we're headed. And the, the stage after the crash, of course, is a, a return to some kind of a stable monetary system. Uh, like they had back in the uh, the late 1800s, early 1900s. Yeah, and Ben Bernanke wrote an academic paper, I think, before he became chairman of the Federal Reserve, and he was saying basically if every uh, we they can avoid a currency war if everyone does devaluations either all at the same time or they take turns doing it, and everyone's aware of everyone else's policy. And instead of beggar thy neighbor, it's it's um I, I forgot what he called it. Instead of beggar thy neighbor, it's something 
something else. But these are these are all, you know, Keynesian and mercantilist policies. A lot of these central bankers, whether they're in Japan or in Europe or, or in China, a lot of them went to the same Ivy League schools and learned from the same professors and read the same books. So these guys, you know, they're guilty of, I guess, uh, groupthink <laughs> and confirmation bias and stuff like that. You know, they, they haven't read enough financial history or the, the version of financial history that they've read is, um, you know, government or big government oriented, Keynesian oriented. And I guess they think that, you know, they don't understand that the longer they do these currency wars, um, I think in history, James, um, you've read a lot of history too. John, you've also read a lot of history. The longer these currency wars last, you know, they lead to um, retaliations like, you know, tariffs like Smoot-Hawley and other tariffs. They lead to trade wars. They lead to resource wars where I think prior to World War II, after the U.S. put up Smoot-Hawley, I think the U.S. also put up what um, oil and rubber uh, uh, restrictions on Japan, which basically, you know, destroyed Japan's economy. And then, um, you know, you, uh, trade wars, resource wars, and then potentially a real war. Yeah, I mean, that, that that's what happens. Currency wars do turn into shooting wars. And I think that's the scary thing that we face today. I mean, we've got wars being fought in different parts of the world today. Um, it, it could very easily go out of control uh, based on, you know, circumstances that, uh, um, it, you know, if people keep – if central bankers and, and governments keep messing around and doing the wrong things, hopefully we won't come to that. But you always have to be prepared for a currency war turning into a shooting war. It is kind of amazing how much stuff we're involved in out there, though, isn't it? You know, you've got uh, – in, in the Middle East right now, we're, we're allied with Iran in one theater and – fighting with Iran in a different theater. And, you know, it's maybe three or 400 miles apart. <laughs> and um, that, that's a, a clear indication that we have no idea what we're doing in the Middle East or, um, or in the Ukraine or basically anywhere else, you know. And, and a big part of that can be traced back to the fact that we, we have a printing press that allows us to, uh, to spend as much money as we want to on a military that we think is omnipotent. And then, so we feel like we can intervene anywhere we want to and get away with it because we're so powerful. But we're really, we're borrowing the money in effect from China to run uh, the, this global military empire. And that can't possibly end well. It's, yeah, it's, it's like Rome. Uh, they were borrowing from themselves by debasing the currency over a period of time until eventually Rome and the Roman economy totally collapsed. And it's sad uh, that we don't learn from history. I mean, an American philosopher, George Santayana, said if we ignore history, we're doomed to relive it. Uh, and you really see it happening time and time again. Yeah, yeah. The, the parallels between the U.S. and the Roman Empire are, are terrifying when uh, when you start digging into it, you know, because Rome built this huge empire that uh, that it had to protect. And it had no choice in its own mind if it was going to protect its vast borders to uh, to start creating new currency somehow. And back then they didn't have a, an electronic printing press, but they could debase their coins by adding cheaper metal in place of uh, silver. And they they did that. They had a hyperinflation. And not long after that, the barbarians overran them, you know, and, and uh, we're really heading in the same direction in a lot of ways, except we're doing it in an accelerated way. We're doing it, doing it on Internet time where it took centuries for them, it takes decades for us. And, uh, and we're probably not too far from some kind of definitive crisis at the rate we're going. You know, the, the interesting, uh, the parallels to Rome are indeed interesting. And there's one thing that I've sort of read about in my <clears throat> studies of history. It's when a country builds a wall, it usually is a sign that the country has reached or already passed its peak. You know, Hadrian's Wall was built uh, here in the UK, 100 AD. Uh, Rome had already started declining by by then. Um, the Berlin Wall was a sign that the Soviet Union was in decline. The Great Wall of China was a sign that the Ch Chinese uh, emperor at the time was also in a wall of decline. Uh, we've got a wall now, or they're trying to build a wall, you know, across the southern border. It's a sign that the U.S. is in a decline as well. It's just not coping with the reality of today's circumstances. Uh, it's trying to do too many things for too many people instead of what it should be doing, which is allowing people to live their own lives and let the market operate in a free and unimpeded way or unfettered way uh, without government intervention. You know, that's what the framers created. It worked well enough for 170 odd years, but ever since the gold standard was abandoned or the last remnants of it were abandoned by President Nixon back in 1971, um, it's been pretty much an acceleration in the wrong direction.
Yeah, the, the financial equivalent of, of that wall you're talking about, James, is capital controls, where, uh, where, where you start trying to trap money within your borders because you, you aren't strong enough or attractive enough to, to have the capital flow be positive for you. You know, money's trying to escape. And we're starting to see that around the world now. You know, with, uh, well, Greece, for instance, is considering what certainly look like capital controls in order to uh, to give it the breathing room that it needs to make the kind of financial changes that will allow it to stay in the Eurozone. And uh, the Eurozone itself is looking at things like bank bail-ins, which are kind of a form of capital control, where they just take the money out of your bank account if they need it. Um, and so we're, we're starting to see the kinds of, uh, you know, playing defense policies that, uh, that, that are characteristic of losing societies, societies that have peaked and are on the way down. And it, it shouldn't be a surprise with as much debt as we owe. You know, when you borrow too much money, um, by definition, your, your life takes a turn for the worse, whether you're a country or a family or an individual. It works the same way. And so with all the major countries of the world grossly over-indebted, it shouldn't be a surprise that we're all starting to play defense now. We're all worried about uh, risk rather than focused on opportunity. And, yeah, your, uh, point, your, your point about capital controls is a good one. Um, and in the U.S., um, from a U.S. Uh, perspective, you already have capital controls in the sense that it's very, very difficult for a U.S. citizen to go anywhere in the world and open up a bank account. Uh, because of various policies that the U.S. government has imposed um, on the on the banking system, so that is a form of of capital control. And with regard to the other point you were just making, John, that's also another good point in the sense that if you look at what we the way society is structured, you have two basic groups: you have taxpayers and you have tax eaters. You know, taxpayers fund the government and tax eaters live off the government in one form or another. Now, there is some necessary tax eating in the sense that you want some military, you want some police force, you want some uh, court system. Uh, but the question is, is, well, how much can a country afford? And you now have governments around the world paying out, uh, or put it this way, more people living in countries who are tax eaters than taxpayers. Uh, the U.S., I've seen statistics saying it's 59 percent uh, are reliant on a government um, handout of some sort or another uh, or a government salary or whatever it happens to be. In France, it's also you know, above 50 percent. In a lot of countries around the world, you basically have a situation where uh, the, 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 the private sector, you know, the, the people that are creating the wealth, the people that uh, come up with new inventions, technological innovation um, that raise the world's standards of living that create more opportunities for interaction and more opportunities for commerce. These are the things that enable us to continue to move forward as human beings and improve our situation, you know, year after year after year. Um, th those that golden uh, goose is being plucked um, relentlessly uh, to the detriment of economic activity worldwide. So if you look at a place like uh, Europe, uh, which is uh, barely struggling uh, along uh, in terms of its economic activity, it's not surprising to see that the heavy hand of government uh, has just become too heavy, the private sector too small to support all of the obligations that are being put on it. Yeah, Europe has uh, made it very difficult to start a business. So it's not as easy as here in the United States where you can put a website up and in a month or two you can have a business up and running. Um, I've heard from friends in Europe that it's a lot harder. I think uh, one person in Italy I know said, like, you have to get government approval, I think, to get a website up. And then to get a cash register at your business in Italy, you know, you have to talk to, like, six different government agencies. And there's uh, certain money and payments and other things that have to be uh, given out to to even get approval for a basic thing like that. It's also pretty difficult, though, in the U.S. as well. The amount of government regulations that have increased in recent years, particularly anything dealing with financial um, uh, related financial services, uh, is becoming more and more onerous. Um, so my next question for you guys, uh, switching topics here. Um, you know, we hear a lot on the mainstream media about deflation. You know, the Keynesians are always talking about deflation. The mainstream media is always talking about deflation. Um, but when in modern financial history has a pure deflation been allowed by Keynesian central bankers and central planners for more than a very short period of time? Oh, well, that's, it's not part of that 
um, theoretical framework to allow deflation. Um, and, and during the classical gold standard, um, there was a little bit of deflation each year. You know, money got slightly more valuable because production got better. You know, we, we were better and better at building things and making things. So the price of stuff necessarily went down a bit. And that's that's a sign of a healthy society. Um, in, in the Keynesian framework, uh, government should intervene to prevent any kind of a downturn uh, that, that results in, in lower prices. And so you, you always have this bias towards money creation and deficit spending. You know, it's in, in early Keynesianism, governments were supposed to run surpluses in good times and deficits in bad times. But of course, that's hard. It's easy to just take the deficit spending side of that and run with it. And that's what modern Keynesianism has done. They never, ever run balanced budgets for more than a couple of years, you know, and then they run massive deficits for the following decade. And uh, because of that, we build up more and more debt and the system becomes more and more unwieldy, which requires more and more extreme monetary policy. And now we're at the point where, you know, all fiscal policy isn't even really part of the mix anymore. Governments can't run deficits that are much bigger than they're currently running. So all the pressure is on central banks out there. And that's really the last tool in the shed. If, uh, if lower interest rates and increased money creation won't do it, there's nothing left. And so we're seeing the end game of Keynesian economic philosophy play out right now. And it's, it's a really ugly picture as, as, uh, as it's evolving. Yeah, I, I looked through financial history, guys, and, you know, you could chime in here if you, if you remember any other examples. But, you know, um, even the Great Depression, 1929, they intervened. You know, Herbert Hoover was an enormous interventionist. He wasn't a free market guy. Um, and then FDR, when he won the presidency, I think in 33 was his first year, you know, he had this enormous um, interventionist policy to fight deflation and end deflation very quickly. So there was only def deflation, in quotes, for a very brief period of time. We had the Great Depression in 1920, which was a very, very violent period of deflation. But, you know, wages and prices were allowed to correct by central bankers then, and we had free market forces, and we had a, a, a real recovery in a short amount of time. But other than those examples, I mean, I can't find... A, uh, a historical example from the from modern financial history with cent with recent central banking, where they allowed you know a deflation to actually occur for even a brief period of time. You know maybe in 2008 2009 there was a small credit contraction. It was a tiny little blip, but then you know they went full force with the quantitative easing programs, and I think there was over 16 trillion in bailout money given out that we found out from the one time partial audit of the Fed. So I I just haven't seen any historical examples. Of any of these guys, you know, they're fighting deflation, but they haven't allowed any deflation, really. Yeah, there was one uh, brief example in September of 1992. That was when George Soros broke the Bank of England. There was actually a contraction in money supply in most of the major countries, including the U.S., uh, in that one quarter. But once George Sor Soros broke the Bank of uh, broke the Bank of England by shorting the British pound, central banks went to work and turned on the printing press and just increased the you know the money supply by leaps and bounds, and that little brief whiff of deflation disappeared very, very rapidly. But, you know, it's very interesting because the term deflation has changed a lot in terms of what it was, what it's supposed to mean versus the way it's interpreted. Today, it's often used as, a mean, as an indication of falling, uh, falling prices, but really deflation is a contraction in the money supply. But there's two elements to the money supply, and I think what happened in Argentina um, at the beginning of this century is a good example. The money supply in Argentina declined by one third, just like it declined by one third uh, in the United States during the Great Depression. But prices in Argentina rose by 50 percent, even though the money supply was contracting by one third. What happened was that there was no faith in the government or the government's monetary policy and the currency itself. And people just sold the the pesos for whatever kinds of goods or services uh, or foreign currency that they could buy. And literally, the purchasing power of the peso fell out of bed. So when you're looking at currencies, you have to remember in this world of fiat currencies in which we live, which are backed by nothing but government promises, you have to focus not only on the quantity of currency that's outstanding, you know, what we call the supply of money and measure it in terms of M1 or M2 or M3, but we also have to look at the demand for money. And what happens in a real currency crisis, the demand for that currency evaporates overnight. You have a flight from the currency 
and prices can rise even if the quantity of that currency were to um, in circulation were to decline. And Jason, uh, let, let's go back to something you said earlier too about uh, how, how there was a, a depression in 1920 that uh, that nobody knows about now because it was over so quickly. That happened quite often during the, the classical gold standard where things would get a little out of whack and then there would be a, a one or two year depression, you know, stock market panic, lots of layoffs, wage cuts, et cetera, et cetera. But then it would work itself out almost right away, you know, one or two years. So we don't remember those depressions because they were allowed to work themselves out. There's a and, reason for, oh, go ahead, John. I thought oh, you were no. Oh, no, go ahead, James. I was just going to say the reason for those um, depressions is what's really never talked about today. It's a practice called fractional reserve banking. You know, the banks only have so much of reserves and they lend out more than they actually have in reserves. So the depositor thinks his money sitting in the bank. But in reality, it's out in some 30 year mortgage that the bank can't sell because they can't collect on the, the mortgage because, you know, the property is or the individual who has the mortgage or the company has the mortgage is, is in bankruptcy. So you have this situation where banks uh, borrow short and lend long. In other words, they have these long term loans on their asset side of their balance sheet and short-term obligations to their depositors. And it, it, because of the fragility, the inherent fragility, or even dishonesty, in the words of the uh, Professor uh, Murray Rothbard, um, you know, it's essentially a fraudulent practice. But, you know, depositors think their money is there, but they can't get it because of fractional reserve banking. And it's this fractional reserve banking that's really created all of the turmoil within the monetary system, even under the gold standard. But at least under the gold standard, Fractional reserve banking only had impact for a year or two. You know, the banks would lend too much, which was a, uh, carrying fractional reserve banking to an extreme. The loans could not be serviced, and then you would have the collapse and you'd self-correct. People would learn, and there wouldn't be another crisis for another 10 or 20 years because it was within the people's living memory. But today we have a situation that there's never any correction. 2008 really wasn't a correction in the sense of bringing debts back down to normal levels. And since 2008, we've extended, expanded the debts even more. You know, things like sovereign wealth funds, which are these huge imbalances of uh, global, uh, global capital flows, would never have been possible under the classical gold standard. So we're, we're really in a crazy world. And that's why, you know, John and I decided to call our book The Money Bubble, uh, because the bubble today, the really, really big bubble today, um, you know, it's not the Internet. Uh, that was a bubble, but not a big one. The uh, housing bubble, that was uh, a bubble, but not really a big one compared to what the money bubble is. It's the belief that what we're using today as currency is money. What it really is, is just a money substitute circulating in place of money, which is, of course, gold or silver. Yeah, the, the largest uh, bubbles, in my opinion, guys, are in currency. They're in the bond market. So those are the two largest bubbles, and they're related now because money is well, money, I'll use money in quotes. It's not. I don't consider, you know, fiat currency money, but um, it's not real money. But um, it's a money it's considered by. It's a money substitute. Yeah, but but money is debt now. So so money and debt are linked, forever linked now in the system that we have now, the the runaway system. Yeah, they're linked now, but they're only going to be linked until this bubble pops. When people realize this money has no substance to it, it's all based on assets, and those assets don't have the value that it's supposed to do based on the. The, the nominal purchasing power of the money that's circulating out there. So it's going to be like what happened in Argentina back in 2000. Even if they contract the supply of, of currency, the flight out of the currency is going to be greater. Uh, the drop in demand is going to be greater than any drop in the quantity of currency. But I don't think they're even going to drop the quantity of currency. They're just going to continue printing and printing, you know, more QE and more schemes to try to keep this bad currency in circulation. So, so to summarize all this, we, we took a, a bad idea, fractional reserve banking, and we combined it with a really bad idea, fiat currency, and, and we got exactly what you would expect, a society where debt goes up year after year after year. It, it never goes down, even during uh, nasty recessions like 2008, 2009. We respond to a downturn by taking on even more debt, by accelerating the process. And we, we are now reaching the, uh, the logical conclusion to this process where debts are just unbelievably high and all kinds of things that aren't called debt are actually obligations of one kind or another, like unfunded liabilities and derivatives. So that if you add it all up, the, the amount of debt in the system is catastrophic. 
and therefore can only end with some kind of catastrophe. And so it becomes a, a matter of timing. You know, when does this happen and what sets it off? And that's what we can't know, you know, whether it's next week or five years from now. But this stuff has to be worked out one way or another. And the only way it can be worked out is through a lot of this debt being eliminated, either by inflating away the currency or mass defaults and, and uh, bankruptcies and depressions. So that's our future. <laughs> and we're getting exactly what you would expect us to get, given the policies of the last 100 years. Yeah, yeah, I think I think the global central planners, these Keynesian central bankers, especially the ones in the United States and Japan and Europe and uh, England, they they want a controlled stagflation, financial repression. They want to keep suppressing interest rates. They want the yield curve to basically go to zero across the board. That's what Japan is basically on. They're furthest down this path. And, you know, they want the asset prices to stay high because all the people on Wall Street are all holding all these assets with leverage, you know, whether it's a carry trade or something else. But I, I don't think that they can get away with, you know, holding um, more of these assets with more and more debt. Um, my question for you guys is, do, do you think the crack up boom has already started? Do you think um, these drastically devalued currencies, whether they're the yen, the uh, euro, the dollar, whatever, um, are these asset markets starting to drastically price in these um, rapidly devaluing currencies? I think it has already started and you see evidence of it in a variety of different ways. When you're in a crack up boom, uh, as Mises defined it, you know, people are leaving the currency and trying to put their money into something they think is going to hold value. So they're putting money into the stock market. Uh, they're willing to lend money to the German government at minus 2%, or excuse me, minus uh, uh, 10, 10 basis points, thinking that, the, um, that, that their money is going to be safe, the pur purchasing power is going to be preserved. It's just sort of a crazy mentality. But you're seeing it in terms of artwork. Uh, the prices are going up. You see it in terms of real estate in hot spots like uh, UK, where I live here in London, Singapore and other places of the world, you know, people who um, are the super rich understand it. They, under, they understand that they would have rather put 100 million into a Monet painting rather than put 100 million in the bank because Monet painting is going to still be there after the banks collapse or the currency collapses. So it's a rush for tangible assets. And I think that we're at the early stages of a crack up boom that's going to accelerate uh, as people understand that the situation uh, is a, uh, a box canyon that governments have put themselves into and they can't get out of without destroying the currency. And, and right now you've got the smart money handing off a lot of stuff to the, the dumb money. And uh, that, that's the early part of the process where the, uh, the, the best hedge funds and the super rich are making these decisions. They're getting out of their currency and they're getting into real assets. So the, the next stage is for that idea to spread to the rest of society. And that's really the timing issue. You know, when does the middle class around the world figure things out the way that the 1% has already figured it out? And when do they start shifting en masse into hard assets and out of financial assets? And that's, that's really the question. And, and it seems like we're not at that stage yet, but that's the kind of thing that can happen in a hurry. You know, new ideas will spring up and we'll hit a critical mass and and feel it'll feel like overnight everything changes. But I think we I think basically you'll have six months when the middle class wakes up before, uh, you know, the, the currency totally collapses. Yeah. yeah, and we've also seen, you know, besides some of the other assets you guys mentioned, we've seen, you know, diamond prices go through the roof. Um, I've listened to diamond dealers talk about how, you know, they can't get certain types of diamonds at wholesale or they're paying over 500 percent uh, higher prices from even a couple years ago. So the, the prices on these assets, basically, other than gold and silver, um, you know, a lot of the regular commodities, the base metals, you know, those are those are not really considered the best stores of wealth. It's kind of hard to store barrels of oil or a uh, humongous amount of copper. But these other hard assets that are a little bit easier to move, the price on these things are going through the roof. Well, even gold and silver is doing quite well. If you look at it in terms of euros, uh, South African Rand, Brazilian you know, cruzeros and a bunch of other currencies around the world. Uh, in euro terms, the gold is up 10 percent so far this year. You know, that that's a really interesting chart that I think it was Goldcore published just lately where the, where they showed gold's performance in all the different major currencies. And uh, it had a um, an across the board um, correction in 2013 after a really nice run of something like 10 or 11 years. 
But then in every other currency besides the dollar, gold is back up again. It's been rising for the past two years. Only in the U.S. dollar is gold in a bear market. The, uh, the other currencies, uh, in other currencies, it's still in a, a bull market with a correction in 2013. So it, when, when you're thinking about gold, you have to look at um, its performance across the board, not just in one currency. And so when we shift gears in the currency war and start pushing the value of the dollar back down because our economy is slowing, which it is, by the way, Goldman Sachs just cut first quarter um, GDP estimate to 0.8 percent now. You know, so we're, we're trending down towards zero again. So, so when we start to panic because the economy is slowing down because our currency is too strong and start pushing the dollar back down, then gold will resume its bull market in this currency as well. So, uh, I think that um, a couple of years from now we'll look back on uh, on what felt like a really serious bear market in gold, and we'll realize it was just a bull market in the dollar temporarily. And uh, yeah, we're. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, we're starting to see some signs that the bottom is coming in, in, the, in the gold market. We're starting to see some mergers and acquisitions from some of the gold miners. Um, we're, we're starting to see some um, a, a lot of physical buying you know, out of China. I think it's exploded. Uh, China, I think, has already bought over 500 tons of physical metal in 2015. So they're on just an enormous clip. And India, I think, is on an enormous pace as well. Um, my, la my last couple of questions for you guys, and I have a lot more, but you know, we're only going to have time for a couple more, is on the gold market. Um, if many primary gold and silver miners go bankrupt in the next 12 months and many mines come offline, uh, what do you think would happen in the gold and silver markets? Well, you know, gold is the only thing that we produce for accumulation. All of the gold mined throughout history still exists in above ground stock. So looking at it from a big picture point of view, if you eliminate some of the annual production, uh, it will have an impact, particularly if those mines that go under have made forward hedges and everybody's expecting the gold to be delivered or the people who are on the other side of that hedge expects the gold to be, be delivered. So it will have impact. But the reality is, is that this above ground stock of gold grows by about one and three quarters percent per annum year after year after year, uh, very, very consistently. And that's why gold has the same, uh, preserves purchasing power over long periods of time. An ounce of gold today buys the same amount of crude oil that it did, you know, 60 years ago. Uh, the silver and two silver dollars buys the same amount of petrol to fill up the uh, gasoline to fill up the family car, just like it did when I was a young kid growing up in Ohio. You could use two silver dollars to fill up the family car. Um, so it, gold will and silver will continue to perform this function as money. So you take a little bit out by mines going under. Uh, it can only be bullish, but it's not going to necessarily have a, a big impact. What you re should really look at to see what's going to drive the gold market higher is what governments are doing to currency. But at the end of the day, when that currency collapses, you know, whether it's five years from now or 10 years from now, an ounce of gold, I'd be willing to bet, will still buy basically the same amount of crude oil that it does today or that it did 60 years ago. Gold is money. It's not an investment. It's not an investment because it doesn't generate cash flow. It's just a sterile asset. So you can't apply normal investment techniques to it. What gold does is it preserves your wealth. Now, if it goes up in terms of the currency, what it's doing is it's taking wealth away from the people who hold that currency and transferring it to the people who own gold. But gold itself is not creating, current, creating wealth, just like a stack of $100 bills uh, sitting in the vault is not going to create wealth either. So you have to remember that gold is money and it should be compared to other forms of uh, currency, uh, the dollar, the Swiss franc, the euro and everything else. Miners, on the other hand, are investments. And you have to look at a mining company the same way you would look at the investment or the, of the stock of any other company. You know, the quality of the management, um, look at the political risks, look at the balance sheet and all of those things. And this is something that John and I stress in the money bubble. You have to focus on gold being different from the mining companies themselves. Yeah, and okay, two points there. Uh, James, first of all, you, you are absolutely right that gold doesn't do anything. It just sits there. It's a, it's a store of wealth. And so it's quote unquote price um, doesn't say anything about gold itself. It says something about the currency in which you're measuring gold. So if the, the currency, like the dollar, for instance, is being aggressively inflated away, then gold's price will go up in dollar terms. But gold itself didn't actually do anything. It, it buys pretty much the same 
um, uh, amount of life's necessities year in, year out. And it's the currency, it's the way you're measuring it that changes over time. So we're, we're actively trying to destroy our currencies in order to manage our debts. Therefore, gold should go up over time versus all the major currencies because they're, they're, the managers of those currencies are doing the, the kinds of things to make those currencies less valuable. And, and the other thing about the miners is that, um, yeah, the, the amount of gold coming out of the ground really doesn't matter much to the price of gold because there's already so much uh, existing above ground. But one of the signs of uh, a bottom in gold price, in the gold price, is when it drops below the marginal cost of production for miners. So when you see a lot of miners going out of business, that's a historical signal that gold is nearing a bottom in its cycle. So, and we're there now. You know, a lot of miners can't make money at today's prices, and a fair number of them can't even stay in business at today's prices. So, uh, based on historical trends, that's a sign that we're probably near the bottom in this cycle. Yeah, I agree. I think the miners starting to go bankrupt. I think that's it because they um, they can't run, they can't really raise any more debt or equity, even at punitive rates at this point. And, you know, they don't have that much more cash in the balance sheet. They've already uh, burned through it a lot. And, um, you know, most of the deposits that were brought online, um, I looked at a lot of feasibility studies since 2009. A lot of them needed $1,200 gold or higher. They needed silver above 22 or 25. Maybe they've been able to cut a little bit of cost here or there and uh, trim as much fat as they can. But there's only so much that they can trim because these these a lot of these mines were very marginal. Um, you know, we've just pulled so much gold and silver out of the ground. James, you brought up a great point there about the uh, stocks of flow ratio. Um, but uh, for silver, silver doesn't have that. Um, you know, a lot of the silver is actually consumed. So there's um, there's not as much above ground stockpile silver. So I think that's why silver could potentially um, have a more effect if a lot of the mines come offline. I, I, the silver price. I agree with you on that, Jason. The way I see silver is silver is a substitute for gold. In other words, right now, 72 ounces of silver does the same thing for you that one ounce of gold does. But historically, that ratio is 16 to 1, not 72 to 1. So as gold goes higher, silver is going to go even faster than gold goes, and that ratio will go back down towards 16 to 1. And silver has – there's one other aspect to the silver story um, as an industrial metal rather than a monetary metal, and that's solar power that's, that's fascinating. All of a sudden, sol solar – is booming and uh, every solar panel every traditional silicon based solar panel um, has this a little bit of silver paste in it so cumulatively the solar industry is using a lot of silver and it's growing exponentially so unless they find a way to replace silver in solar panels uh, that's going to take a big chunk of future silver production off the market and it's going to tighten supplies in, in ways we've never seen before so that, that's a wild card in the silver market. You've got the monetary demand, which is, is good no matter what. You know, silver would be a buy here, even if there was no such thing as solar power. But then you've got this, uh, this new industry coming along that's taking 10 or 15 or 20 percent of, uh, of annual silver production off the market. So that, that could tighten things up in a hurry if those two things come together. If investment demand um, hits the market in a big way, just as um, solar power really ramps up. And I think there's a good chance that that happens in the next couple of years. Yeah, and the miners go bust at the same time. We could have a supply shock. So if we have some of the, a good amount of the primary silver miners either shut off mines or go bankrupt in the next 12 months, and the demand for silver is increasing because, you know, the paper market games, um, you know, we could have a, a pretty big supply squeeze uh, in the near future. Possibly, yeah. Okay, well, my final question for you guys has to do with China's physical gold holdings. Um, do you think China is going to update uh, the world on its uh, the People's Bank of China? Their central bank will update uh, their physical gold holdings in the next couple of years? I think it's going to happen by September. Um, and the reason why September is important is the International Monetary Fund is redefining um, the special drawing right. Uh, either in September or October when the IMF meets this year. And China wants to be part of that uh, new definition of the special drawing right. So my expectation is they're going to release it sometime uh, this year. And they may not release the full amount because my view is they probably already have four, three to 4,000 tons uh, in their official sector. Uh, they're probably just going to release enough that they think uh, will show that they are a major economic power, which in fact they are. 
So they'll probably say they have, you know, at least 2,000 tons. Maybe they'll say, you know, more than that. But that I expect it to happen this year. Yeah, I think they'd be stupid, uh, guys, to announce their real physical holding because as long they, they know gold's manipulated, they've been on conference calls with GATA, um, so their sovereign wealth funds have. So they, they kind of know what's going on in the paper market. So they know that they can keep, you know, accumulating this undervalued metal for a very long time. They can keep, you know, um, accumulating it. And we see that those numbers that um, it's not the Chinese government that's buying in the Shanghai Gold Exchange, but the Chinese people are pretty aware of what's going on, too. So the, the people just have a longer term view, I guess, than the people in the West here because the, the stock charts for, um, you know, gold and silver market, uh, the gold and silver stock charts aren't the best right now. And the people here in the West really only buy it if the chart looks good. Uh, they're more momentum chasers or not really value investor or long term players. But the people in Asia tend to have a longer view and buy value. I agree with you. Okay, well, um, I, I really want to thank you for this uh, discussion. We're at about 50 minutes now. I uh, really enjoyed uh, the questions. I have a lot more questions, so maybe you'll be interested in coming back on the future and uh, doing something like this again. Uh, please tell our listeners uh, where they can find uh, the Money Bubble. Well, John, the, the Money Bubble, you, you can um, find an ad for it on dollarclaps.com, and it's also available on Amazon and any other electronic bookstore. Yeah, and it's it's on audiobook now and Audible for our listeners who um who don't who don't have the time to sit down and actually read the book. I think it's like seven hours long on Audible audiobook, and then you can download the Audible app and you can listen to it on the go, like in your car or walking your dog. It's very efficient. Um, and uh, I think your charts and graphs are attached there in the PDF file. So I found that very efficient to uh, listen to your book. Great. Well, um. Well, um, I just want to give you guys a good endorsement on your book. I really enjoyed it. It's probably one of the best books I've read in the last year. I want to thank you guys again for your time. Uh, James, please tell listeners more about Gold Money. Yeah, Gold Money, uh, goldmoney.com. It's an online uh, way to buy and store gold in different vaults around the world. Uh, we have 21,000 customers in over 100 different countries around the world and storing about $1.3 billion of metal uh, safely in a variety of different vaults for customers. Very good. Well, uh, thank you again, guys. I really appreciate your time, um, and I enjoyed this discussion. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, Jason.